addressing the next topic, which was, should I take like two units of fast acting insulin before I do cardio? I mean, that's going to be the stupidest thing of all time. I created Species Nutrition with one mission in mind, to provide bodybuilders and serious athletes with no-nonsense supplements that work. I put my name and reputation on every bottle of Species Nutrition products. If you want to be your absolute best, join the evolution. Hey, this is the game Triple H from the WWE. You're watching RxMuscle.com, the truth in bodybuilding. Rx Television, RxMuscle.com. This is Ask Dave, better known as Hashtag Ask Dave, your 30 minute question and answer show with Dave Palumbo. Whatever is on your mind, be it bodybuilding, non bodybuilding, it is all on the table we're going to jump right into the questions the first two questions on this show from the dave palumbo experience app uh bu -bu 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 -bu. first question your take on testing for diuretics uh but let me get this out of my way all right after all the complications that we've heard of regarding diuretics uh if not testing uh could i mean mentions the ipv specifically could they educate on the subject i.e hiring someone like yourself to hold mandatory seminars webinars etc on property so i think i mean look he's bringing up diuretics in particular but i think this kind of opens up a whole different uh pandora's box as far as seminars and i know so many people have talked about um you know having i guess mandated health insurance yeah. would seminars some sort of uh formal education be a useful solution in your opinion you know i i mean we essentially do that on RX Muscle already. I mean, I'm constantly educating people about everything re related to bodybuilding from performance and anti drugs and diuretics to diet to exercise and all that stuff. So in a sense, we're doing that already. I don't think the IFBB NPC can officially endorse something like that because then it would be basically endorsing the use of drug use. So from a legality standpoint, I don't, I don't think that they would ever do that, nor can they do that. Um, diuretic testing doesn't work because you can beat the test. Uh, we, I mean, if you just it becomes an IQ test after that, you know, and that that just makes people use more dangerous diuretics that, that are not on the on the approved list. And so it, it, it's it's just not it doesn't work, unfortunately. Now, you know why people want to do extreme measures regarding anything in life when when it's unnecessary behooves me. I don't know. But people do crazy things. And there's a lot of coaches out there that do crazy things. And, you know, you can pass a health physical. You know, I was, I'm a big advocate of, of making people have uh, medical clearance every year. You know, if you want to go for hormone replacement, right, at the hormone replacement clinic, you got to go for blood work every six months. And they have to see that your blood work is good so they can continue prescribing. Um, why not have, a, you know, a medical clearance, you know, blood work and something like that in the beginning of the year just to clear the athletes? Hey, you know what? These guys are healthy. They can compete. I mean, that's the smartest thing to do. I, I mean, I don't know why. Um, you know, because, because guys will compete even if they know they're not healthy because they don't care. And so if there is a, someone who is looking at blood work and who's looking at medical clearance forms that are being submitted by the body, individual bodybuilders, doctors, I mean, that, that right off the bat will prevent, you know, some, a, a percentage of problems from happening, maybe long-term kidney damage and, and liver damage and stuff like that. But you know, the bottom line is that you could be perfectly healthy and then you could do something really stupid right at the end with using diuretics the wrong way or overdoing it and you can kill yourself. So that's not going to you know, necessarily stop that. And, and like I said, testing for diuretics might make the situation worse because people will do more extreme things. They won't drink for three days and they'll wind up in the hospital and stuff like that. So there's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a very slippery slope. And I think that 
people who compete should take it into their own you know, hands and say, hey, you know what? I don't want to get sick. I don't want to die. I want to do this for a long time. What's the safest way to do it? Who's putting out information there that, that is going to help me do this in a safe way? You know, there are, I'm not the only one, but we put out a lot of really good information that if people listen to on a regular basis, they would probably be a lot healthier and, and they would have a lot less problems because anyone who listens to me knows that I don't advocate for extreme anything, especially that last week before a show. People do the craziest, nuttiest stuff for no reason. They don't need to. And um, that's either because they're ignorant and they don't have the education or they're working with someone who likes to sensationalize that last week to make it look like they're some kind of special guru that has some, some secret that no one else has. And the truth of the matter is that just ain't <clears throat> Second question again from the Dave Palumbo Experience app. Um, what blood markers should I have looked at? Uh, in what range do you want to see them for optimal fat loss and muscle growth? Say that again. So uh, it, it's kind of like a two-step question. talking about what blood markers uh, they should be looking at and in what range. I guess the second part of it is what range uh, for optimal fat loss and muscle growth. <laughs> well, you know, blood work is done mostly for health and, and purposes. The only um, blood work that, or blood test that you would do maybe to opt, make sure that you're, you're burning fat optimally would be to make sure your thyroid is working well. But that's a slippery also test also because there's a big range. You know, when we look at active or free T3, which is the active thyroid hormone in the body that actually controls the metabolic rate, some people are higher, some people are lower. And you know what? A lot of times raising T3, free T3 by taking a drug like Cytomel um, doesn't necessarily mean that you're a better fat burner because you have a higher T3 level than the guy who has a, a lower T3 level in, all, that's also in the normal range. Like I don't have excessively high T3 levels in my body. I have, I'm actually like maybe mid-range, but my protein, or I should say my fat burning machinery in my cells, in my muscle cells, the cells that burn the fat, oxidize fat for fuel, that's where my, my genetic gift is. I can burn fat better than most people. So T3 basically is just turns on the metabolic rate. Once, you're, once your metabolism is on in an optimal level, and, and it's funny because your body will regulate what optimal is. It knows what optimal is. So for my body, you know, and I take, remember, I take T4. I take re replacement therapy because I don't have a thyroid gland anymore. But my body regulates itself in, in around T3 mid-range. And that's enough so that my body's metabolic rate can work optimally. And then how I burn fat is, is not determined about by my, my T3 levels. It's determined by my fat burning machinery inside the muscle cells, the mitochondria of my muscle cells. And mine just happened to burn fat at, at a much higher rate than most people's. And that's probably partially genetic, partially maybe from you know five years of long distance running. I don't know that they've shown some evidence to show that your mitochondria can change. Um, when subjected to severe oxygen debt and, and you know, extreme conditions. But I know people that can take a huge amount of T3 and still not lose body fat because they just are not good fat burners. So it's hard to say on, on like, give you a value that your blood work should be at that would optimize your fat burning. Now, obviously, if you can get to the higher end of the T3 range, sometimes that's better, but sometimes it's not because for people who are hard gainers, like me, if you have your T3 too high, you might not be able to put muscle on or you might lose muscle because it might, you, because remember thyroid hormone metabolizes carbs, it metabolizes fats and it metabolizes protein. Usually the anabolic steroids or the growth hormone will protect the muscle from being, you know, it'll, what we say, it spares the muscle tissue from being metabolized. But if you have a really fast metabolism, you might not be able to eat enough food to, 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 to spare it. So these are all, you know, variables that you have to take into account. So, yes, yeah, so to get back to what I was saying, it's very variable. It's hard for me to give you, you know, blood work markers that you need to look out for fat burning. Really, what it has to do is you have to kind of know what your metabolism. Do you burn carbs better? Or do you burn fat better? Do you need a higher protein? Or do you need a lower protein? And once you figure out what diet works for you, that optimally will optimize, you know, how you burn fat and, and, and the best diet for you to follow. Um, assuming, like I said, assuming your thyroid gland is in the normal range, there's really not a, nothing else that you need to look at. Let's go to the Instagram questions again. If you're not already following us on Instagram, the handle is official underscore RX muscle. If you're watching us here for on YouTube for the first time, 
We welcome you. We ask that you subscribe below, hit the notification bell. You're not going to miss any of our upcoming shows, segments, updates, whatever is going on. Obviously, over the course of the next month, we're going to be doing our preview segments for the 2023 Arnold Classic. Arnold Classic, first weekend of March. Of course, we'll be there uh, providing on-site coverage, wall-to-wall coverage. Uh, Dave will be back in studio. So as soon as the night shows wrap up, uh, and after prejudging, Dave will give you his insights as well. We'll be doing all the uh, in per- in-person one-on-one interviews. Everything that goes on during the course of the Arnold Classic will be there to cover. Um, and as always, we appreciate all of your support throughout the course of the calendar year, on-season, off-season. Um, <clears throat> first question from our Instagram feed. <clears throat> yeah, I'm some sort of apologies. You're going to have to bear with me. It's been a little under the weather. Uh, Dave, painful test, 400 shots and stiff syringes. I've heard people say about putting loaded syringe into warm water for heating up the test, also making the syringe easier. Is that a good idea or a bad idea? Uh, I'm not really, I'm not really following what the what the problem is with the syringe. Is it's not, it's not moving the syringe? What's the problem? I mean, in his own is in in his words, stiff. <laughs> so I guess painful in a sense, but uh, that's why he's asking if uh, I, I guess is it, putting is, it into is, warm is, water. The syringe is hard to push this stuff through. I'm not really following what he. What he I'm not really following what his what his problem is. Is he saying that the the oil won't push through the syringe? Yeah, he doesn't specify. I mean, I, I mean, all he really provides us with is that it gets <laughs> it's stiff, and that he's heard people putting a loaded syringe in a warm water, I guess, to heat up the no, test and I making mean, the syringe easier. I'm not sure. You know, I'll, look, the only thing I can talk to on this is that some people will put, you know, some people put their gear in the refrigerator, which I don't know why you shouldn't put steroids in the refrigerator. You don't want to make the oil. It's not going to ruin it, but the oil, it gets very viscous. And so sometimes, you know, if, you, if you're drawing up a very cold fluid, it might, it, you know, it's not moving so well. It doesn't go through the syringe. So people say heat it up. I mean, you could really hold it in your hand, you know, and that'll warm up the, um, the testosterone uh, or whatever's in the, whatever oil you're using. And that will make it draw up into the syringe a little more easily if that's what he's really asking i don't know now so, sometimes i i've seen people who have trouble like the syringes they, they use like an off-brand syringe they don't use terumos or something like that and the, the syringe is not doesn't move that well or i know people that reuse their syringe a million times and then what happens is the, the plunger starts not moving so easily after a while and uh, that you know i don't recommend that you reuse your syringes that's not to say that i didn't do it in the past like an idiot i did but <laughs> But don't, yeah, I would. If you use a new syringe every time, the syringe should be very, very smooth. Um, if you don't keep your gear in an area where it gets too cold, the oil should should be very free flowing. If it's not, then you, you can hold it. Like I said, hold it in your hand for for ten, five, ten minutes, and it'll warm up. You don't need to put it in hot water or anything like that. Like that, because here's the problem. I I've seen guys. I know it sounds insane. I've seen guys put like their gear in boiling hot water. And thinking they were going to help because they thought maybe it wasn't dissolving properly, and then the the idiots drew up the the, the oil before it cooled, and then they injected into themselves, and the oil is like scalding hot, and now it's inside their skin, and they burn. It's 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 a disaster way to have. So don't use <laughs> super hot. Don't put it in the microwave. Hold it in your hand if you want to warm up the the oil a little bit. That that's my best uh, suggestion to you. Uh, topical question here, and I'm glad that they brought it up. Uh, full disclosure, we're still working on assembling a cast for a new episode of Iron Debate. So what we're going to be debating is something that Lee Priest uh, mentioned in last week's Iron Rage. Um, essentially, that there really is no, in his own words, that we should get rid of the 212 division, um, that the best of the 212 have shown that they're capable of standing in with the open class with the big boys. And that's no more evident than what we saw at this past year's Olympia. Um, so the question is from Gunny P Fitness. Your thoughts on the top three of the Olympia, all five, seven, and below, and just, I guess, to mention two of those three former 212 athletes. So they want me to comment on what, what I think about them? Yeah, well, what do you think about, I guess, the top three being under five foot seven? That's because remember, true. keep in mind, I also, right. I also had this qualifier too, Dave. Remember, yeah. We did Iron Debate and leading up to the Olympia, so much of the commentary or I guess the um, <clears throat> detractors for Derek Lunsford are saying that that he, he would get lost in the shuffle because of his height, that he yeah. would be too short and that would be exposed. Obviously, it turned out not to be true, but that was one of the elements that were being discussed. So I guess that's, 
you know, the question here, I guess, your reaction to two or the two, rather the top three all being mm. under the height of five foot seven. Right. Here's the issue. First of all, the judges can only judge what's up there on, on the stage, right? And bodybuilding goes in cycles, all right? For some reason, the big guys are not doing that well, <laughs> okay? Ian Valliere was off. Uh, Samson Dowdle looked great, but he could have been tighter. You know, Andrew Jack was great, but he could have been a little tighter. So the big guy and Rami was off, right? So the big guys always have an advantage, let's face it, because bigger – with the same, you know, structure and, and, and muscle mass always looks more impressive. But having said that, if the guys are not in shape or they're not at their best, you know, you got to vote for what's up there. And, and lately it's been the short guys have been coming in good. And it's been the guys coming off that two twelve division who seem to come in shredded out of their mind. Derek, you know, Lunsford, uh, Bonac came from the two twelve. Uh, Hottie Shupin came from the two twelve. I wish we could have seen Flex Lewis on stage. He would, you know, he would have been a great guy as well in in the open class switching over. And Sean Clarita, he's a short guy. He doesn't, he doesn't even, he's not even two hundred pounds. The guy's like one hundred eighty five pounds, maybe soaking wet. But these guys are coming in shredded, and that's what's winning shows. And I say it all the time: conditioning wins shows. They're not going to give away a Mister Olympia title to someone who's not in shape. It's not going to happen. So right now, it's the shorter guys. Next year, this year, whatever, it could be the taller guys. Maybe Andrew Jack shows up at the Olympia out of his out of his mind shrink wrap and wins that show, or or Samson down, and then we'll be saying, oh, all the big guys are winning now, you know. So it's really it, it, you never know who's going to show up, you know. Who's ever the best guys of the time are those are the guys that do well, and then people will be saying, oh, we need to keep the two twelve class because look at all these big guys we got, and the short guys can't beat these big guys. <laughs> so it, go, it goes in waves. And that's why I really respect Lee Priest because there was no 212 class. He was always the shortest guy, you know, him and Sean Ray. And, and they were, they always held their own up on that stage because they brought conditioning and they had a great structure and they had really impressive round muscle size and shapes. And so Lee's argument is that why do we have a 212 class? Short guys can compete. They just got they got to step up their game. That's all if they want to compete. If they want to be the best in the world, they got to step it up. Lee feels like the two twelve is almost like a cop out. It's like a like a like a minor leagues in, in his mind. He's seeing it that way. I don't necessarily see it that way. I, I like the fact that these the shorter guys have another venue to compete in. But he feels you know because he always competed with the biggest guys on stage, the Paul Delets and the Dorian Yates and the Nassers, and and he held his own against all those guys. So. I see both sides of the argument. Let's go to Lee Hom. Do you only need a high dose of glucosamine for joint repair and maintenance? What about chondroitin, MSM, and UC2? Uh, I guess he's referring to my arthralized formula. You know, when you work out, okay, and you break down muscle tissue, okay, and then you eat protein, lean source of protein, right, to, to repair it, chicken, fish, turkey, whatever, uh, meat, what do we do to repair the joint and connective tissue that we're breaking down in the gym? So when you're when you're bench pressing, you're not just breaking down this muscle, these muscle fibers, the tendons and, and, and that connect to the bones, you know, they're getting they're getting beat up too. You know, they're getting stretched and this, and then they're they're being repaired and remodeled. But we don't eat cartilage and we don't eat ligaments and tendons in our diet. We throw that stuff in the garbage, right? Because it doesn't taste good. What do we give our body for raw materials to repair those? And, very, and for most people, it's very little. And I think that's why joints and connective tissue break down over time. If you take in a, a, a high-potency joint replacement product like my Arthralyze product that has four grams of glucosamine and four grams of MSM along with boron and, and, and chondroitin and uh, UC2 collagen, what you're doing is you're giving your, you're giving your body what it needs on a regular basis to repair not only the muscle, but to repair the, the, the connective tissue aspect of, of the muscle. And whether you're injured or not, you should be taking this on a regular basis because you're not taking it in in your diet. If you were eating, you know, back in the, in the poverty days, in the 20s, they were eating like, uh, or what was the, was the 30s or something like that? Whenever, whenever there was poverty in this country, people would make soups out of like bones and all the all that great, you know, that's where the bone whole idea behind bone broth came from. 
all the cartilage that would melt into the soups that people would be eating would be helping their joint and connective tissue. And that's why they feel there was maybe less arthritis back then. I don't know if that's the case or not. But the bottom line is for a, a hardworking bodybuilder, you need joint you know, repair ingredients in your diet. The truth of the matter, and I've said this before, is we should be scooping our glucosamine and MSM in a scooper and putting it in our protein shakes because that's how much you need. You need a lot. Uh, the problem is the stuff tastes horrendous. No one would be able to, to drink a shake with, with, with glucosamine. It, it, it's vile, and it has like a fish-like smell a little bit. It's really disgusting. So you have to take it in capsule form. The problem is most people don't want to take a lot of pills, so they take like 2,000 milligrams a day, and they think they're getting enough, and they get no joint relief whatsoever because it's like trying to take a protein. It's like trying to drink a, a whey isolate shake, and you're only drinking five grams of whey isolate. Yeah, you're actually taking in whey isolate, but you're not really using an effective dose that's going to do anything. So – that's why you have to take five pills twice a day of Arthrolyze if you want to get the right threshold ingredients. And I tell people if you're injured, you can take more of it to help with the repair process. But on a regular basis of maintenance, you want to take five pills twice a day. Um, we have some good parallel questions here. So I'll give you one of them. Uh, Relentless Luca, do you think – and, and I, by parallel, I mean uh, they're asking about, I guess, difference between 90s bodybuilders and today – uh, but they're two different questions at two different angles. So one of the questions from Willett and Luca, do you think the way food is processed now is one of the reasons physiques look different? Today, everyone asks, why does bodybuilding look different? And I don't think anyone has actually thought about the actual food. So much of the conversation, he's right, uh, surrounds the gear and, I guess, peptide usage today uh, or quality of gear. But what about the actual food? Do you buy into that or do you feel as if, a true bodybuilder would stick to, I guess, the cleaner side of foods? Or do you think that processed foods might have somewhat of an impact today? Yeah, yeah, I'm not really buying that because you know why? <laughs> I Back when uh, Metrics first came out in the early 90s, Connolly was, had athletes using like drinking only shakes like all day long just to, to kind of like collect data from that. And guys look fucking awesome <laughs> from that. <laughs> uh, I used to eat McDonald's every single day. You know, I people, you know, would eat like junk food. And, and I, I've seen bodybuilders with the worst diets of all time and had the most incredible looking physiques that I've ever seen. And, and you would never believe in a million years what these guys were eating. So I think your body will utilize If your body needs protein, it's going to use whatever you give it. You know, that doesn't mean you're going to be healthy from it. You, you could get, you know, heart disease and you can have, you know, other problems, you know, in your going on health wise, but the muscles will use whatever they're given. So if you give them protein, they're going to use protein. You know, they'll, they'll, they'll find a way to extract what they need and, and use it. The problem is that um, I think the physiques don't look the same is because I think it's a training phenomenon. I, I don't think that the um, it has anything to do with the drugs because I think guys will use more drugs um, today to compensate for what they think is not better quality. So I don't necessarily think that that's the problem. I think guys, number one, we, we happened to have gone through a renaissance in the 90s of incredibly gene genetically superior individuals that just happened to all come about at the same time. You know, you see it in football. You see it in other sports, too, where you have just have a golden era of, like, great athletes. And then you might get a die down, and then you'll get another you know, resurgence. I think we're getting another resurgence now of really, really gifted athletes out there. It's just going to take another, you know, couple of years to really nurture these people. But – but that's the nature of, of, of life. It goes in cycles, you know. And so, if anything, the supplementation is, is, is better today. The knowledge about diet, all the diagnostic tests we have, things like smartwatches, we have more data at our disposal. We should have better physiques, you know, if that really was the case. But we don't necessarily have the depth that we had in the 90s and i think that's once again just from the genetic pool of people who are who are competing and that there's no way to control that it's like i said it goes in cycles you know but look i mean no one expected rammy to come onto the scene when he did and we got a crazy crazy we thought ronnie was going to be the biggest of all time and rammy comes on the scene and he's the biggest of all time doesn't mean he's got the best physique of all time but he certainly was the biggest mr olympia of all time at over 300 pounds on stage so Comes in cycles. Look at who expected to see Andrew Jack after he only was competing for a year and a half come out of nowhere. This guy, what is he going to look like in five years? So, well, Dave, yeah. actually, not to cut you off, but uh, so uh, you mentioned Andrew Jack, and this is sort of where I was going to go next. Yeah. The other question, again, the two parallel questions. Um, and again, <clears throat> this may be more of an opinionated question, but the question was 
do you, because I guess in his own words, this, mm -hmm. uh, that a lot of the bodybuilders from back in the day, you had a lot of bodybuilders that could have gone into top bodybuilders that could have gone into other sports, right? Um, obviously, we mentioned Ronnie Coleman. He theoretically could have gone to the NFL. Andrew Jacked is a, I mean, really when you, I mean, we're talking to him at the Olympia, this is an athlete. I mean, this is someone that's tried all the different sports or whatever. Um, he could have gone, you know, in other, you know, sporting directions at a high level, you know, but chose bodybuilding. Do, do you feel as if that may be a difference that back then, and again, someone like an Andrew Jack, you had a lot more athletes that could have been high level pros elsewhere? No, I, I think that people go into bodybuilding because they're, 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 they have an affinity for it. In other words, they, they have a loving, a love of it. You have to have a love of bodybuilding is a kind of sport that if you don't love what you're doing, you're not going to be successful. And I'll tell you why, because it's the only sport that, that never has an off season. There's never an, a time where you can just relax. Like, you know, oh, football season's over. All right, I got, I got several months now to just chill out till training camp starts for next year. That's not it. The day you get off the stage, the next day you got to be back in the gym preparing for next year already. Cause you have to put new muscle on and then shed it off, shed the fat off again. So, it's, you have to love the process. No person who, who does not love the process will be good at bodybuilding because they'll just stop. They'll be like, this is ridiculous. I, don't, I hate doing this, and, and it never stops. So you have to love the process. So it takes a special person. So you might get a guy who could be an awesome football player like Ronnie. I'm sure Ronnie could have been a, an NFL football player, but he just didn't want to do it because he loved bodybuilding so much so that he was drawn in that direction. And sure. If, if we took every athlete in this country who's in football and baseball and this and that, and we, we took the best of the best, we probably would have an Olympia lineup that would make every other year look pathetic because we have some really gifted athletes who I, I don't blame them. They're making millions and millions of dollars, you know, playing baseball and football and, and all and basketball and stuff like that. Why should they go into bodybuilding? You know, I, I don't blame them for three seconds. And if the, if the rewards for bodybuilding were as high as some of these other sports, you probably would see a much, much um, greater gene pool in our sport. And probably the levels of physique are, are, we, we would see would be mind-boggling. I really believe that. Uh, Angelo versus Angelo recently started a cycle back to basics after a long layoff due to injuries. Started 500 mg test, 250 mg DECA with potential to scale up if needed. What dosage would you recommend after a two-year layoff from cycles to start? And what would you taper up to? Keeping in mind, this is my first cycle back in a couple of years after injuries. Yeah, you know, it, it really depends on what the person's goals are. If you want to get back on stage, you, you have to ramp up pretty, pretty quickly up to your effective dosages. So if we determine, and this person agrees with the fact that 1,000 milligrams of testosterone is, is – is what's the maximum, you know, the, the right effective dose to put muscle on. And, you know, four or 500 milligrams of, of Decker a week or Equipoise a week is going to help put muscle on. Then I would ramp up to that within the first three weeks and start growing, start putting that muscle back on. I mean, it's, it's silly to go on a hormone replacement dose of 250 milligrams a week or even 500 milligrams a week when you know, all right, you know what, you know, you're probably, you know, you want to compete at a high level, you, you got to get that muscle and you got to add some new muscle. So um, when you first come back from a long layoff, you probably shouldn't take any drugs. You should just train and eat, get back whatever you can naturally. Once you kind of hit a plateau, then introduce the anabolics and, and do your cycle and start an effective cycle. You know, if, if you always like 750 tests a week, then do that, you know, but it's silly to start like you're a beginner again, even though you might've had a long layoff only because you want to get back on stage. So you don't want this process to take longer than necessary. Once again, having said that people could do whatever they want, you know, whatever makes them comfortable. I, you know, people come to me all the time. I, I just took a big layoff and I always sit down and I ask them, I say, look, let's talk. What's the goals. When do you want to get back? Oh, you want to get back on stage in, in like six months. Well, then we have to, you know, we have to expedite this. You don't have that a lot of time. So if someone came to me and said, hey, you know, I'm 24, I was a bodybuilder when I was a teenager, I want to get back into it, but I'm in no rush, that's a different story, you know, uh, but that's not the case for this person. So I would probably get back onto an effective dose within three weeks.
Let's go to what. So we have two uh, insulin related questions, one from uh, Ivan Benny Nets and one from Ivan Bodybuilding. Uh, Ivan Benny Nets, have you ever heard of someone destroying their insulin sensitivity from using slow acting insulin? The second, uh, have you ever heard about using a low amount like 2-3 IU of fast acting insulin on a fastest state before cardio? For faster fat loss, um, I know he goes on to say, "Don't say your usual, don't do kooky stuff." I know it sounds crazy, but what it really was. So the first one, uh, destroying insulin sensitivity from using slow acting insulin. Oh, these questions. All right. Well, the first question is a good, a good question. Um, will taking a long acting insulin ruin your your insulin sensitivity? And when we say that, what you, what we mean is. Will it reduce the amount of insulin receptors on the outside of these cells that, that and which recognize insulin and allow insulin to do its job, which is to push glucose into the blood, into the uh, excuse me, into the muscle cells, or into the liver cells, or into the brain cells, whatever the case may be. Long-acting insulin, when you take it, because it acts in the background, your body really has no idea whether it's if it's the insulin that it's released on its own and trickled out of the pancreas, or it's exogenous. It can't differentiate between that. So having the right amount of, of background insulin there is just gonna modify how much insulin your, your, your pancreas releases. So if I take 10 units of, uh, of Trishiba at night before bed to, and to help aid my pancreas and make sure that I absorb all my, my glucose in, you know, overnight and in the background, Okay, my body doesn't know if I have more or less. If 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 I take too much, what'll what'll happen invariably is my pancreas just won't produce as much. It'll lower its own output of of, of <laughs> insulin. So essentially, my insulin is is now restored to the right amount that it should be. So my insulin sensitivity won't change because there's no reason for the receptors to pull back. Now, having said that, if you start banging in large amounts of fast acting insulin every single meal and you overdo it to the point where you have to actually eat more carbs because your blood sugar is dropping too low, that could cause a decrease in, in insulin receptors because your body might say, whoa, we got too much insulin here. We're gonna really drop blood sugar too fast. That's not good. Uh, most people don't do that. Most people are not banging insulin at every single meal, excessive amounts. So taking exogenous insulin really shouldn't mess up insulin sensitivity. And that's why I, I think it's a big mistake when these doctors try to put people on like, you know, you know, metformin and all these other oral medications to help with blood sugar control when all they can do is just put them on a long acting insulin. And that solves 90 percent of the problems. And like I said, there's really no side effects of a long acting insulin because it doesn't drop your blood sugar enough. Now, addressing the next topic, which was. Should I take like two units of fast acting insulin before I do cardio? I mean, that's going to be the stupidest thing of all time. And I'm not saying the person who's asking it is stupid because there's no such thing as a stupid question. I'm saying anyone who does it is, is very stupid because here you are, you want to get on, on, on a bike, right? And you want to burn stored body fats. You want to mobilize fat, okay? You're doing steady state, you know, not high intensity cardio because high intensity cardio burns carbs, right? We want to, we want to do like steady state, you know, cardio. And the way the steady state cardio is fueled is by this, you know, stored body fat getting mobilized and, and, and oxidized into energy. Why dropping your blood sugar while you're, before you're doing this would help in any capacity mobilizing fat from the fat cells? I have no idea. All it's going to do is make you feel terrible and have low blood sugar, especially if you're getting on a bike. Sometimes when you first start biking, too, you got to remember the, you know, before your body starts mobilizing fat. The first like you know couple of minutes you might be using some glucose for fuel initially until your body says oh wait a second this is not really that fast let's start using let's start oxidizing some fat so the last thing you want to do is get low blood sugar while you're doing cardio you'll feel terrible and you'll have to get off the bike or off the treadmill or whatever you're doing and you're gonna to have to eat something so all you can do is screw yourself up it's not going to help you burn fat better i, I don't know why people think low blood sugar is going to help you mobilize fat better your body says to itself I need energy, depending on what activity you do, okay? If you're going to sprint from here across the street and back, that energy must come from glucose because it's a high-intensity activity. So the body will take glucose and will use that, no matter what. Whether you're on a ketogenic diet or not, it's going to use glucose for that activity, okay? If you say, you know what, I'm going to walk around the block at a nice gingerly pace, okay, your body says, hmm, 
what can I use to fuel that process? Well, I can use some glucose, but it's really, why, why should I? I'm going to use stored body fat because that I have plenty of time to generate ATP because I'm not, the demand for energy is not extreme because it's not a high intensity activity. It's a low intensity activity. So the body starts mobilizing and burning stored body fat and releasing free fatty acids that then get used for, to turn into ATP, uh, which is going to fuel the muscle cells in a sense. So, you know, taking insulin and lowering blood sugar is not going to benefit you in any way whatsoever. And, and, I'd, and I'd like someone to tell me why it would benefit me to do that. And if they can do that and show me the science of it, I, I'll change my opinion. But until that time, it's, it's, it's an asinine thing to do before doing cardio to take insulin. Uh, let's go to Nico Cantum, your good friend of the show. My hematocrit is 56. Do you think it's a good idea to take one baby aspirin a day? Just because you have high red blood cells in your body, because we all know that we know that even horm hormone replacement at like 100 milligrams per week can cause elevations in red blood cells because exogenous testosterone or anabolic steroids tell the bone marrow to produce more red blood cells, which is actually really good if you're an endurance athlete. And it's actually good even if you're working out because you can get a better pump, right? More red blood cells. That's why a lot of athletes use these anabolics to begin with. Now, having said that, okay. What causes the blood to clot? Not red blood cells, not the thickness of the blood. It's the platelets in the blood. It's testosterone, anabolic steroid. While telling the bone marrow to increase red blood cells, it doesn't tell them to release platelets. As a matter of fact, I look at probably look at five people's blood work every day, minimum. That's how much blood work gets sent to me. People asking me how they think they're doing. They're doing. And I'll tell you what. In most bodybuilders, myself included, the platelets are low. And I always wonder if platelets are low because the body knows they have more red blood cells, so they realize they don't really have to clot as much, you know, and they don't want to clot. I don't know. But all I know is I've never seen a bodybuilder who has high red blood cells, which would be high, and then that would impart high hemoglobin hematocrit. Hematocrit is the thickness of the blood. The uh, hemoglobin is how much hemoglobin is in the red blood cells. The more red blood cells you have, the more hemoglobin you have. So all three of those go up together. I've never seen a bodybuilder with high platelets, ever, never, never high, which is weird, right? You think, well, someone would have, no, no, never high. So especially in people who have high red blood cells, I never see high platelets, which tells me that, that obviously the body knows how to equilibrate itself. So you don't have to worry if your platelets are normal, you know? It's when the platelets are high and the red blood cells are high, that could be a problem. Also, you know, in, in situations where you might be uh, have some kind of a, a syndrome where you are clot for no reason or you have a clotting issue where you over clot or something like that. Uh, obviously, now with COVID and the vaccine, people are worried about clots. But you know what? Don't don't be. It's not red blood cell related. In other words, if you're getting clots from a vaccine or from having COVID. You could have low red blood cells and you'll still get those clots. It has nothing to do with the volume of your blood or how many red blood cells you have. It just causes whatever you have to cause clots. So you're not going to induce yourself to die you know, more frequently than, than Joe Blow, who doesn't even work out and has normal red blood cells. Um, once again, look at the platelet kind. I don't like to take aspirin every single day. I'll tell you why. It's not good for the lining of your stomach and it's not good for your kidneys long term. So you got to be careful of that. You know, now granted when my, when my foot was in a cast, you know, for three months, they made me take a, an aspirin every day because my, I wasn't getting any movement down there. If you don't move an area and you get stagnation of blood, you can get clots. That's a different story. But if you're moving around and you're normal and you're, and you're healthy, having elevated red blood cells with normal platelets is not that dangerous. I, I, I think these doctors over, get nervous about this and you'll see a lot of the hormone replacement clinics make you give blood and they won't prescribe the testosterone unless you bring that down. And I've said this before, if you start donating blood and, and, and giving blood to, to kind of get those levels down, what your body senses, your body doesn't know you're going to donate blood. It thinks you lost the blood because you're bleeding. And so it makes your body produce more red blood cells. So a lot of times guys have a baseline of red blood cells that that's okay. It's a little high. And then they start donating blood every 60 days. And then Little by little, incrementally, the red blood cells start creeping up higher and higher and higher because the body thinks it's bleeding and, and it's losing blood. So it keeps overproducing now red blood cells. So that's an issue you have to deal with, too. You don't want to get into that whole domino effect. So 
yes, keep an eye on your red blood cells. Make sure they don't go excessive. Check your platelets. Make sure they're normal. Um, but I wouldn't be just knee jerk, you know, taking aspirins and, and um, uh, donating blood, you know, on a regular basis for no apparent reason. We'll take a couple more questions. We got a lot of questions this week, so we absolutely appreciate all of your input, your contributions. Um, I mean, again, this show is literally uh, for you. So what we'll do is uh, after this show, I'll, I'll go through some of the unanswered questions. I'll send Dave, um, you know, the remainder questions and Dave will select the best ones and we'll do individual <clears throat> videos on those. And then uh, for those that don't get asked uh, or rather to don't that Dave doesn't make a video on, we could save them for next week's episode as well. But again, we appreciate all of your contributions to the show. Um, you know, it's, it's funny. We uh, haven't had one of these in quite some time. I hate this show. So if, if you <laughs> joined us recently, years ago, like two, three years ago, we used to have this thing where, um, you know, Dave would go to like an expo. Dave would go to a fitness show, whatever, the Olympia, Arnold, or what have you. And people would always come up to Dave like, hey, Dave, love the show, love the show, love the show. Dave would tell him, look, if you really love the show, tell me that you hate the show. So that kind of took on a life of its own. So we used to have like very creative, I hate this show. So somebody would say, I hate this show more than, and then come up with some, you know, kooky scenario, whatever. It was hilarious. We started actually giving, we, Dave, we might have to bring it back. We're like the best, I hate this show, uh, gets whatever, free stimuli or something like that. But uh, it was a lot yeah, of fun. You don't live in another country. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, that that too. But uh, nonetheless, good to see one of those again. This one uh, from Bitcoin Will. I uh, hate to show more than Big Rami hates his Mr. Olympia placing in 2022. The question, best HGH dosages and compounds to stack it for fat loss. How much GH is acceptable before bringing insulin into the equation? It's a loaded question because, you know, unfortunately, everyone's body responds differently to growth hormone. And some people could take a lot of it and they don't really have a blood sugar issue. Some people could take literally like a, a, an IU of it and they, and they have issues. So it, it, it's, it's hard to you know, make a blanket statement like that. I find that, you know, if you're trying to burn, I never have guys use more than four IUs a day when they're on a contest diet, you know, maybe off season, they might, maybe I'll, I'll inch it up a little higher sometimes. And I don't even think that's necessary, but you know, when you're dieting, you don't want to be holding excessive amounts of fluid all the time, because then you're going to look like you're fat when you're really not. And you're just a little bloated. So I usually, what I tell people is about three I use in the morning when you wake up, you do that daily while you're dieting. It's going to help you lose body fat. It's not going to affect insulin sensitivity. It's not going to make you insulin resistant very much. Not to mention also when you're dieting for some kind of a competition or to lose weight, you're really on a lower carb diet. Even if you don't do a ketogenic diet, you're on a lower carb diet. So your carb intake is not high anyway. So that's not your, your blood sugar levels should probably be pretty normal unless you are a, a, a legitimate diabetic or type 2 diabetic. Uh, what I find is I have a lot of guys and, and, and even some women who take a long acting insulin in the off season when they're eating a lot of food because they just can't. They wake up with really high, you know, fasting blood sugars. But when they start dieting for a competition, all of a sudden their blood sugars improve because their carb intake is, is lower. So remember, you know, and we never thought about this years ago, and I don't know why it never occurred to me, but if you're eating, you know, an exorbitant amount of food in the off season, seven, 8,000 calories a day, some guys have to consume, right? Think about the insulin requirements that your body has to absorb all that food. It's astronomical. So even if you have normal, you know, pancreatic, beta pancreatic function, beta cell pancreatic, excuse me, beta, pancreatic beta cell function, you know, it, you just might not be able to make enough. That's a lot. You know, every single day you're, you're demanding, you know, you know, 600, 700 grams of carbs have to be processed and absorbed. Sometimes you, you, some people's pancreas don't produce enough insulin to do that. I don't think mine ever did. That's why I responded very well when I took an exogenous insulin because I couldn't absorb all my food. So almost that's why I was the first thing I do when I start working with someone off season, I start having them test their fasting blood sugars in the morning. And if they're running high, we substitute, you know, if we assuming the person's okay with it, we use a fast act, excuse me, a slow acting or what we call basal insulin to help the body absorb all that food to make sure that we're absorbing it. Because a lot of guys don't gain weight because they just, just don't absorb all their, all their nutrition that they're eating. So I think that that's going to be something that 
most bodybuilders will do in the future. And this is something that was never done 10 years ago. Um, actually, you know what? I'm going to throw this one in as well. It's from Sasta Venkatesan. Sorry if I butchered the name. Um, he wants a conclusive answer to this. I've normally elevated estrogen levels in my body. So even if I take 500 mg of tests per week, I'm getting gyno. To compensate that I've been using aromatizers <laughs> and SARMs uh, throughout my prep, but doing so, I've had a bad sex drive while on cycle. What is a solution for guys like me with elevated estrogen levels when it comes to sex drive? Okay, now here's the issue. Okay, the person is is, is complaining that they, you know, that they're getting gynecomastia. That's and that's a typical bodybuilding complaint. I don't want to have breast tissue right over here. Um, who does? Right? No one wants to have that. So the question becomes. What do you do about it? So what most people do, they take a ton of aromatase inhibitors, right? They take Arimidex. When that doesn't help, they take Nolvidex on top of that to block the estrogen receptors. So now they have no estrogen in their body from blocking aromatase enzyme. Anything that might be floating around is completely blocked with the Nolvidex, right? Because the Nolvidex blocks the estrogen receptor and they still have gynecomastia. Why? Because it's genetic. It's like taking a woman with big breasts and thinking that you're gonna give her an aromatase inhibitor and an estrogen receptor blocker, and you're gonna, and her breasts are gonna decrease to nothing, and they're gonna shrink and shrivel up to a size A, even though they're a D cup right now. It doesn't happen once you have the tissue there, and a lot of guys have it just genetically from childhood. They don't even know it's there because they never dieted down to the severity that they do now for bodybuilding, and they see, holy, what is this? This is not fat. This is this is actually breast tissue here. The only way to get rid of that is is to do surgery and have it removed. That's why I send people to Dr. Blau in White Plains, New York, because he's the best, okay? If you don't take it out, it's never going away. You could take all the aromatase inhibitors and all the estrogen receptor blockers you want. You could inject cortisone into there, which we did back in the day too. It'll shrink it a little bit. It's never going away until you have it taken out, okay? And when you have it taken out, you'll, you, your life will be a lot better. So my the advice is save up, go to Dr. Blau, have the gynecomastia taken out, and you never have to worry about it again. Because the, what happens is what this person is doing is they're overtaking aromatase inhibitors and, and, and estrogen receptor blockers, and they're eliminating their estrogen in their body. So they'll, but, and that's why they have no sex drive. But they don't understand why they still have gynecomastia because it's not going away. That's what you don't understand. It doesn't matter. It's there. Once it's there, you're not getting rid of it, especially if it's, if it's sizable. And so you can, turn estrogen into a negative number if it was physiologically possible, which not. But if you can do negative estrogen, you still would have a problem. But all you're doing is causing side effects. And you got to remember, not only is estrogen necessary for, for sex drive, it's actually necessary to sensitize androgen receptors so that they're going to respond to all the testosterone and anabolic steroids that you're taking. So you don't want zero estrogen. You want low estrogen. You don't want zero. Last question from Todd Payette Universe. Um, so before I ask this question, it, you know, we get this comparison fairly often, right? Like uh, bodybuilders from the 80s, from the 90s that had more of the classic physique and whether or not if they competed today, what, whether they would have competed in classic physique or in the open class. And I don't know, certain bodybuilders you've seen, they, it's almost as if they take offense to that. Um and sometimes I wonder, is that something done in flattery or is that something done? I don't know. But the question is, of these bodybuilders, who do you feel like would dominate classic physique today uh, with their best respective shapes? You mentioned Samir, Bob Paris, Barry DeMay, Brian Buchanan. Is there anyone else you could think of? So if th that crop, yeah. if they competed today in classic physique, who of those do you think would absolutely dominate? Well, you know, I, I try to think about like what bodybuilders would actually be able to make the weight because some of the guys they mentioned, you know, definitely have a classic physique, but they're too big. They would have, you know, they would have weighed too much. Uh, I think Barry DeMay would have been a, a great, a great classic guy because he was really tall. So I think he would have, he would have fit in fine. So think when you think classic, think tall bodybuilders, maybe Ralph Moeller. I don't know how, how much he weighed back in the day, but he might, he, toward the end of his career, he got kind of big. I don't know if Bob Paris would have made it, but Bob probably would have sucked down. He would have liked classic physique. So I think Bob probably would have been okay, but he was heavy. You know, he was heavier than his weight class would have been for his height, but he probably could have sucked down and gotten harder. And he probably would have been a good classic guy. 
Um, I think Barry would have been like that division would have been made for him. He would have been phenomenal because he had a really good look. You know, Joe Weider was using him to, to market everything, you know, back in the day. So he was the quintessential classic physique. You know, you look at a guy like Sean Ray who had a beautiful physique, but he was big, you know, for his height, he's, he's thick. He would have had to weigh 20 pounds less probably to make the classic physique weight. So he, the short guys from, from yesteryear would have never made classic. You, you have to think tall guys, you know, probably Arnold. Arnold would have been a classic guy, you know, back in the day. He would have made weight. He didn't weigh that much on stage, you know, and he, he certainly could have been a little bit leaner when he competed. So he would have definitely been a really good classic guy. Um, he might have been Mr. Olympia, you know, 10 times in classic today. I don't know. You know, he didn't have the legs that like, uh, you know, that some of the guys had today, but that's because he wasn't really competing in this era. You know, he probably would have had the legs had he been able to, um, you know, had the technology to train him and all the other, you know, little extras that help us be the best that we can be. So it's hard, though, because once again, it, you can't compare Mike Tyson to Muhammad Ali, you know, because they didn't compete against each other. And so it's not really a fair comparison. Uh, the guys today probably would wipe the floor with the guys, you know, from that era, from Arnold's era, because it's just the, the physiques today are so much, so much crazy better. You know, they're, they're just harder, grainier, you know, better development, you know, better separation. Guys really were not that hard back in the day. And that, that's fine. You know, Robbie Robinson might've been a good classic guy, you know, had he been able to make weight as well, um, because he had a really good classic physique. So, once again, it's fun. You know, Frank, Frank Zane, I, he, I, I can't believe I forgot him. Frank would definitely have been a classic physique guy, no doubt about it. The fact that he won the Mr. Olympia is incredible because he was not heavy by any means. He was probably in the 180s, you know, when he won the Mr. Olympia. And that's that's probably – he might have been the smallest Mr. Olympia of all time weight-wise. So, But it's not really fair because would Zane have done well in this year's in this era? Probably not you know, because the guys are way better than him. He had a nice physique and everything like that. But, you know, for that era, it was very good. But once again, the classic guys today would wipe the floor with the guys from the past, for sure. So before we go, I just wanted to address something real quick. Because yesterday, on yesterday's episode of After Hours, uh, many of you expressed concern uh, for Armin Adibi. So I spoke to Armin Adibi last night. So I wanted to make sure that I get this on air before we wrap. Um, he's fine. He's good. He's, he's not on anything. Uh, he's not going through anything. The simple truth is this. And, and again, this is verified from him. It, it, him and his wife have a business, right? And um, they've been dealing with shipping. So, and they're fulfilling all the orders themselves right now. So this entails a lot of late nights. They have kids. Uh, so you you imagine the responsibilities that comes with that as well. Um but, you know, he was telling me, he's like, they, they were up till like three, four in the morning. He was on hardly any sleep, you know, and obviously everything that he, they have to do in the morning with their kids. And then obviously getting back onto the workflow with the business. But he's good. He's fine. Um, <laughs> you know, it's funny because a lot of you have messaged us about, you know, seeing more of Armin, right? That you, you appreciate what Armin brings. Of course, you know, Dave had Armin on. Uh, heavy muscle radio on olympia weekend that was very well received so yes we will have armin on uh we've been discussing uh bringing back that show guru talk you know which was originally created so that we could get dave to pair up with you know other coaches you know other bodybuilders talk about you know some of the science some of the science beyond the training the nutrition the diet um you know so, so we are going to be featuring him more but i just wanted to put it out there he is good he is fine um, and yeah. then, you know, like I said, he told us that he will make sure he gets a full eight yeah. hours sleep. Uh, Monday I'm laughing. Night. I'm he laughing because when we first had my son and my wife and I were new parents and we were nervous and we were up all night, you know, and we were getting like, you know, two hours of sleep a night. When Sid and I would do Ask Dave, I swear, I used to fall asleep while, while we were doing the show. <laughs> Literally, I would I would be dozing off, and 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 I'd actually have to ask Sid to repeat the question um, because I I, I I was literally asleep. That that's because if you don't get sleep at night as a bodybuilder, especially and you're training, you, your body just you you can't keep you physically can't keep your eyes open. I would fall asleep anywhere. It, it didn't matter where I was, so I can completely relate to what he's going through. So all good. Armin is good. And we'll be back next week for After Hours. If you haven't already seen yesterday's episode, it is an absolute doozy. Another long-winded two-hour episode with about eight different topics sandwiched in between. A lot of yelling, a lot of screaming, a lot of people getting cut off. 
exactly what you appreciate out of After Hours. Uh, of course, all new episode of Heavy Muscle Radio with Dave and Chris Aceto. And then tomorrow, of course, all new episode of Iron Rage with Lee Priest. For Dave Palumbo, I'm Sadiq Faruqi. We'll see you next time.